Initiation by Elizabeth H. Chapter 43, The Young Priest Appears. Several years went by in which my husband and I lived pleasantly and happily, our love for each other unchanged. I continued my work as a sculptress with lots of assignments, and in my free time, more and more people came to me for psychological consultations. Several times a week, I gave lectures on self-recognition and understanding based on the secret knowledge Tehotek had given me in Egypt. And whenever I felt like resting from my exertions, there was always my beloved piano. Every day I practiced spiritual yoga and even attained the ability to go into deep trances. But the last highest door of my pathway remained closed and locked before me. Having attained a certain degree of spiritual development, I found the pathway toward the complete realization of myself was blocked by an obstacle like a wall. I couldn't break through with my consciousness. Every year, I spent several months living alone in our forest lodge and practicing yoga. The young fruit trees I had planted years before were now big, strong, well-developed trees. And still, I practiced with unabated diligence. Yet the guardians of the secret gateway refused me admission. It was autumn once again, and I left our little house in the forest to spend a day in the city, celebrating my father's 70th birthday with the whole family, our relatives, and our many friends. The following morning, as I was preparing to start for the trip back to the forest lodge, our telephone rang. An elderly friend asked me what I was doing that afternoon. I told her I was free. The famous writer with whom I had studied in India under Maharishi has arrived and is staying in my house. If you're interested, come around this afternoon and you can talk with him, my friend said. That afternoon, I rang my friend's front doorbell. Stepping into the parlor, I caught my first glimpse of the man who had attained world renown through his books on yoga and the great yogis in India. At my first glimpse, I was taken aback. There in front of me sat the young priest who had helped me with my last preparations for my initiation in my long-ago life in Egypt. We exchanged a few comments in which I mentioned that I had read his books and I had been practicing yoga for a long time but still was unable to reach the highest goal. Other guests dropped in and we were all soon involved in a general conversation which lasted far into the evening. There was no further opportunity to talk with him alone. In leaving, I thought, so nothing happened. Secretly, I had hoped the famous white yogi would help me ahead on my mystic pathway. The next morning, my friend rang me up to tell me that the writer wanted to speak to me alone. If you have time, come around again this afternoon, she invited me. Entering her parlor, I found the famous writer sitting in the lotus posture on the sofa. I too sat down and he asked me, what do you wish of me? I have no wishes, I replied. I'm living quite contentedly in absolute inner peace. Then why have you come to me? What do you expect of me? I want reality, I said. After a moment's silence, the writer looked at me and he asked, And your absolute inner peace? Isn't that reality? Yes, indeed, it is reality, but I'm looking for more. I feel like Moses, who saw the promised land but never got there. I believe I can see it too. But I'd like to get in. I'm not satisfied just seeing it from the outside and seeing what's inside. I want to get in myself. He smiled. Yes, he said. You're standing in front of the great door with your hand already on the doorknob. It's extremely rare that anyone can progress up to the point that you've reached all alone and without the help of a master. You've probably been initiated in some previous life. And now you only need to take that last step through the gate that separates you from the great goal. I looked at the yogi. Doesn't he remember he was a priest in ancient Egypt and I knew him then? 
Or is it just that he would prefer not to talk about it? From his impenetrable gaze, I couldn't tell. I know that already, I answered. And I want to get through the door, even if I have to break it down with my fist. And do you believe I can help you, he asked. If I am ready for it, yes, you can certainly help me. And if you are ready for it, you believe I can help you? He asked again. Yes, I answered firmly. Then, as if waiting for his reply, he pointed to the chair opposite where he was sitting and he said, Sit down over there, close your eyes, and think yourself intently into your heart. I did it as he said. I closed my eyes and I concentrated intently on my heart. Then, with my eyes closed, I saw a strong yellow current of bright light flowing out of the yogi's solar plexus, accompanying me like a circle, and then encircling him again like a big figure eight. Simultaneously, I felt I was coming in my concentration to the point I had so often been able to attain in the past without being able to go forward, and now I felt like I had a great power foreign to myself, reaching into my consciousness and carrying me forward as if through a door into an infinite depth beyond. Every concept of time disappeared, and I hadn't the faintest idea how much time had passed when I heard the voice of the white yogi again. Now you may open your eyes. In doing so, I realized how far away I had been from earthly physical consciousness. I didn't feel like talking because it seemed superfluous to say anything at all. I have set up a contact between your personal self and the over-self, the writer said, because you're ready for it. From now on, whenever you have a question, concentrate on me and you'll get the answer the same day. On your person or on your higher self? He smiled and said nothing. I understood perfectly. It was completely useless to waste a single word talking about the person. From that day on, I found myself one group of people meeting at my friend's house and meditating under the leadership of the yogi. A few weeks later, he left us to continue his travels. Once again, I was alone, and I found myself living outwardly, just as I had before. About a half year later, I was sitting with a number of friends, listening to one of the group talking about black magic. He said black magicians chose a few disciples, whom they use as blind tools to carry out their will without resistance. These disciples are possessed by the black magician, lose their independence completely, and are finally destroyed. The next morning I remembered these words. And I began to wonder whether I had been lacking in caution in meeting with the famous white yogi. I was still convinced that he was a white magician, if he wanted to call himself anything. But I had nevertheless put myself completely in his hands with a blissfully innocent trust. Was he, after all, a black magician? Or really a white one? How can I know? How can anyone know? whether he's dealing with a white or a black magician. This question really bothered me. That afternoon, we were sitting in one of my husband's old school, with one of my husband's old school friends. And while we were chatting, he told us how that very day he'd been leafing through the pages of an old book and how in doing so he'd come across a highly interesting chapter about the difference between white and black magicians. The white magician, when he wants to help one of his pupils onward, binds the pupil to himself in the form of an eight. In this way, he leaves his pupil his full independence because both teacher and pupil form the, mid form, form the midpoints, each of his own individual circle. On the contrary, the black magician takes away his pupil's independence by taking him into his circle with himself in such a way that the black magician is in the center of the circle and the pupil just inside the circumference in the same way a satellite orbit forms a ring around the sun. 
I listened to this story with the keenest excitement. Our friend didn't have the vaguest idea he was giving me the answer that I was seeking. I had not mentioned the matter to anyone, and yet I got my answer the very day my question came up. The higher self, God, always finds a human mouth when he has a message for us. For the self, there is no such thing as an obstacle.